All right, it is 12 o'clock on the dot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Abe. I'm one of the chief residents here at the UWMC. I have the pleasure today of introducing our grand round speaker, Dr. Andrew Sabatini, Amber Sabatini. Dr. Sabatini is assistant professor of emergency medicine and adjunct assistant professor of health systems and population health. She is a federally funded health services and policy researcher with expertise in studying how the payment and delivery of hospital care affects patient outcomes, resource utilization, and quality, especially for public care populations. Among other projects, Dr. Sabatini is a principal investigator for an R1 from the National Institute of Aging, which aims to study how Medicare readmissions policies have influenced the growth of observation stays and examine the unintended consequences for older adults with unplanned hospitalizations. She's going to speak with us today about the intended and unintended consequences of readmissions as quality measures. So without further ado, I will turn the stage over to Dr. Sabatini. And as a reminder, please post your questions in the chat and I will pose them to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. So I'm really excited to be here to be able to talk to many of my colleagues who I've crossed paths with over the years. It's sort of a shame we can't see each other. <clears throat> um, but I know that, um, well, I spend a good portion of my time doing research in the policy space and the health services space. And so um, I realize that as clinicians, we often don't get much exposure to both the business and policy aspects of medicine. So I hope this talk is informative for you. As Ryan mentioned, I'm currently principal investigator of a grant that's looking at the unintended, unintended consequences of the HRRP specifically as it intersects with observation stays. And so that's kind of where this talk stemmed from. But that work is sort of in its earlier stages. And so while we'll touch on it and it'll be peppered in the talk, this is meant to be an overview of the current state of literature in around readmissions as quality measures. So let's see. Uh, housekeeping, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. All right, so here's an outline. This talk's divided into three segments. Uh, the first segment really talks about what is the relationship between hospital readmissions and quality. And uh, in kind of preparing for this, uh, this talk, I wanted to go back and understand what was the context in the early 2000s leading up to the Affordable Care Act and the implementation of these value-based payment policies um, and why were readmissions elevated as a priority? And so I, I went back to that literature and we're gonna to touch on some of that, you know, what was in the national consciousness um, at the time? What do we know about preventable readmissions? Um, we are then going to cut over to uh, talk about the current repertoire of value-based payment policies that feature readmissions. And then the last part of this talk is gonna focus on specifically the hospital readmissions reduction program and its impacts intended and unintended on readmissions and talk about some of the major conversation about what has always been a very controversial policy. All right, so let me just move this. So why are readmissions important to policymakers? Nearly all of um, the value-based policies that incorporate readmissions have been driven by Medicare. And that is because readmissions in the Medicare population are both common and costly. I'm sure many of you who've been around for a while are familiar with the statistic that before the Affordable Care Act was passed, nearly one in five Medicare patients were readmitted within 30 days of a hospitalization. And importantly, Medicare's largest outlays are for hospital-based care. And at the time, 20% of all payments to hospitals were for care that was being delivered during the readmission. So it was obviously on the radar of policymakers. The other thing that they noticed is that readmissions were highly variable. So in the early 2000s, uh, there was a stream of um, very influential papers that came out from the Dartmouth Atlas project that basically showed um, significant variations in healthcare spending for Medicare beneficiaries that didn't seem to be related to um, quality in any meaningful way. And so readmissions were no different in that um, between states with the highest quartile of readmission rate versus, uh, so what am I trying to say? So states that were in the highest quartile of readmission rates 
had readmission rates that were 50% higher than states in the lowest quartile of readmissions. Um, and administrators were also worried about the um, perverse financial incentives that were created uh, by readmission. So specifically under the fee-for-service system, uh, nobody really took ownership or accountability for a, pa a patient's care in between uh, care venues. So they were admitted to the hospital and then they were discharged from the hospital and they went back to the ambulatory system, but there was no incentive to um, coordinate that care, at least initially. Um, and in fact, poor care, so if you had a really, um, if you gave really cruddy care during an index admission and your patient suffered a complication, you could bill for a higher rate for that complication. If you, um, if you gave non-evidence-based care that led to a readmission, you would actually get paid more as a hospital for that readmission. So, well, I don't think any providers sought, you know, increased readmissions. There was no incentive to keep readmissions down. And in fact, it increased revenue for hospitals. And again, there was also nobody that was really accountable for transitioning care. So in addition, at that time, there was um, sort of a renewed focus on quality. Um, and that was largely driven by this Institute of Medicine report crossing the quality chasm, which um, really shined a light on all the deficits in quality in the United States. When you couple that with the fact that there was an imperative for Medicare to simply reduce costs, and um, this is a more recent projection of when the Medicare trust fund will become insolvent, but essentially graphs like this have been produced for the last 20 years where Medicare has been pegged to be insolvent in the next five to seven years. And generally policies are implemented that kind of kick that can down the road a little bit. But in general, Medicare is in trouble. And so there's an imperative that it actually needs to reduce costs. And so the thought was that readmissions are one of those low hanging fruits that you could easily reduce costs. Um, they were preventable and they could improve patient satisfaction, sort of like a triple threat. So um, what do we know about readmissions? In more current data, there's about 3.8 million, uh, million readmissions per year across all payers, and 60% of those are among Medicare beneficiaries, so about 2.3 million. An average cost for each readmission is about $15,000. And when you look at the top 20 diagnoses, which comprise 50% of all hospital readmissions, um, sepsis being the highest condition that leads to readmissions, um, but in the top five are heart failure, complicated diabetes, COPD, and pneumonia, three of which are currently incentivized under Medicare's hospital readmissions reduction program. So readmissions have always been seen as failure events. And um, there's clearly a lot of factors that go into whether a patient's gonna be readmitted, um, including patient social determinants of health and their own characteristics that are um, not as modifiable. But there, were, there are quite a lot of areas where a hospital can impact readmission. So um, through the quality of care delivered, specifically the appropriateness and evidence-based treatment, provision of evidence-based treatment, whether or not um, assessing the patient's readiness for discharge, making sure that they're discharged at an appropriate time where there's enough resolution of their symptoms, um, med medication reconciliation, enhanced patient education, and transitional support with scheduled follow-up I put on there. All sort of things that over the past 10 to 15 years have truly been incorporated into sort of the standard discharge process, I think, from hospitals. In the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a number of reports, uh, studies that came out where they had done uh, medical chart abstraction and then through expert consensus, uh, evaluated which admissions they thought were potentially preventable. And those studies ranged from nine to 50%, even higher in some cases. Um, and so there was this idea that quite a lot of these could be prevented through that potentially preventable through better coordination of care at the hospital level. I found this study that I thought was 
really interesting. So this was published in 2016. It's part of the Project RED, which is a, a, a Boston University group that has developed a sort of a comprehensive transitional care program. Um, and they did this really incredible study, the Home Run study, where they, um, across 12 academic medical centers, uh, reviewed a, a thousand readmissions. They selected them randomly, five every week, and they interviewed patients, per, um, launched a survey of both the discharging provider on the prior admission, as well as the current admitting provider, sometimes uh, looped in primary care providers, if those were available, if surveys could be obtained from the primary care provider, and then did a structured chart abstraction. And then through a consensus process, determined whether or not the team felt that the admission was potentially preventable. And the number that they landed on after that pretty extensive process was about 27% of readmissions were deemed preventable. Um, half of those that were preventable by changing hospital care specifically. Um, I thought what was really interesting is that that number is very, very consistent with prior literature. So this was a systematic review of um, all the studies uh, prior to 2011 that had focused on readmission reduction, and they sort of landed at this 27% figure as well um, in terms of uh, the number of randomized control trials or child abstraction studies and uh, of the number of admissions that could be preventable with better hospital care. So going back to this home run study, the factors that were related to uh, preventable readmissions are the things that I'm sure all of you know. So inadequate treatment of symptoms, inadequate monitoring of medication adverse effects or non-adherence, um, inability or uh, inadequacy of follow-up appointments, uh, issues around patient education, such as their lack of awareness of who to contact after discharge or when or when not to go to the emergency department, um, inadequate provision of post-acute care services um, and making sure that their home environment, that they can effectively carry out the discharge plan, discharge from the hospital too soon, and uh, problems with transferring information between settings um, and specifically from ambulatory providers that their uh, records not being available to hospital-based staff. So, so they landed on the 27% is the pool of potentially preventable readmissions. Um, these are clinical trials that were very important in forming Medicare's readmission policies. Um, and they essentially all launch comprehensive discharge interventions. Mary Naylor's work from the 1990s uh, found uh, so she used nurses to coordinate care for a very complex, frail population of patients, older adults, and she found a 17% percentage point reduction with the implementation of this randomized control trial. Uh, Eric Coleman's care transitions intervention, which is more of a patient self-efficacy approach, teaching patients how to effectively manage their conditions at home found a 3.6 percentage point decline in readmissions. Um, this is the Project RED iteration of the care transition. That was a 3.7 percentage point uh, reduction in readmission. Um, specifically, what I would point out for these three randomized control trials, that the Naylor study focused on a population that was much more complex and had far more opportunity to improve because they had much higher rates of readmission than the other two populations. Um, and then the most recent study, Project Boost, which wasn't really a randomized control trial. Instead, it was an implementation exercise where the uh, research team gave technical uh, advice and toolkits to hospitals to implement some adaptation of these best practices that had already been um, delineated for transitional care programs. And they found a two, point, two percentage point reduction. In general, more recent systematic reviews of these care transition programs have seen declining benefit in terms of uh, the amount of readmissions that are reduced from implementing these programs, and that's 
probably because we've already declined readmissions to some degree. So uh, these are what interventions, complex interventions are telling us. These are the pool of readmissions or the potential effect that we could see with better care transitions through randomized control trials. Um, in this more recent systematic review uh, that kind of looked at the care transitions interventions that are out there, the features of the effective interventions tended to be uh, complex and multimodal with at least five components. Uh, they all did a comprehensive evaluation of risk factors for readmission. They uh, tended to try to augment patient and caregiver capacity for self-management. They tended to be team-based with at least two individuals. Um, and they coordinated care across inpatient and outpatient settings. And finally, they were intensive with multiple home visits and patient contacts. So in kind of reviewing this literature, uh, you know, Medicare was very aware that readmissions were costly, that a good portion of them were potentially preventable, that they were highly variable, and that if you could bring the poor performing regions or hospitals down to the better performing level that billions of dollars and tens of thousands of readmissions could be saved a year. So in this context, um, Medicare passed a number of policies that heavily featured readmissions. And this is the timeline of all of the policies that are currently in effect for uh, hospitals at this time. So um, in general, there was a movement from incentivizing first developing the ability of the health system to track and report quality measures, and then incentivizing hospitals to report those quality measures. So we call that paper reporting. And that has in the last decade transitioned into pay for performance where hospitals are actually paid on their performance. They get incentive payments if they do well, or they get penalties if they do poorly. Um, the first policy of relevance actually, at, this was new to me. I didn't realize that the um, reporting of quality measures extends all the way back to 2003. But in 2003, uh, Congress passed the Medicare Modernization Act, which legislated that CMS could reduce payments to hospitals by 0.4 percentage points across all hospitalizations if they did not report on quality. That quality program, which was Hospital Compare initially and has now become Care Compare, began in 2005 with a 10 measure starter set, as you can see down here. Oops, I don't know where my, there it is, as a 10 measure start, starter set. That same year, the Deficit Reduction Act ratcheted up the potential incentive and said that hospitals that choose not to report would lose upwards of two percentage points of their reimbursements. Shortly after that, in 2007, MedPAC, which really this is not really a policy, but they are the big advisor. So then the Medicare, um, uh, they advise Medicare on policies and uh, direction of Medicare reform. So MedPAC reviewed all the literature on readmissions and recommended that uh, Medicare start requiring the reporting of readmissions and initially use a pay for reporting model and then move into a pay for performance model. So that's where that initiated about two, two and a half years before the Affordable Care Act was passed, um, was the architecture for the hospital readmissions reduction program. In 2010, um, readmissions were added to hospital care. And so hospitals started to know what their performance uh, relative to other hospitals were at that time. Also in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed and that really changed the way we do value-based care. Um, the Affordable Care Act established the hospital readmissions reduction program, uh, which was unique in the sense that it was the first pay for performance program, any major pay for performance program that uh, applied penalties. Prior to that, almost all pay for performance tried to incentivize better quality by adding incentive payments, but never penalized providers. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, there was a number of other quality programs, including the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which formed AC, uh, accountable care organizations, 
the bundled payment initiative, multiple other demonstrations. There was expansion of quality measurements, new, new methods of risk standardization. So it really kind of fueled the infrastructure for quality measurement in the United States. In 2012, ACOs were established. Uh, and under the ACO models, they, along with lots of benchmarks, readmissions are one of those benchmarks that ACOs must show improvement on. Um, and also in 2012, the first round of uh, HRP penalties were implemented. In 2014, Medicare decided that it was going to extend its programs to nursing facilities and created the SNF value based. Uh, purchasing program, which uh, also incentivizes uh, or disincentivizes readmissions um, for nursing homes. And then in 2015, um, Congress passed MACRA, which was the Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act. And this will further incentivize uh, readmission reduction. So this was aimed at individual provider or provider groups, not so much hospitals. And Basically, all physician groups have to show that they're either participating in some sort of alternative payment model or this uh, MIPS program, the Medicare Incentive Payment Program, where they essentially report on a set of chosen quality measures. Importantly, though, uh, for any group of clinicians that's more than 15 clinicians, CMS said, we're going to automatically calculate your readmission rate and report on that. And so it'll factor into your incentive or penalty payments under that program as well. And all of these programs are combined, so you can lose or gain under all programs. Um, the MIPS reporting began in 2019, and it's still ramping up. It's um, So the way that that works is there's a pool of money where... Uh, if you're a poor performer, you lose money, and that money is then redistributed to the higher performers. So it's sort of a cost-neutral program. And then in 2020, it was supposed to be the uh, implementation of the SNF value-based purchasing program, but COVID's kind of messed that up a little bit. So short story is, in all of these programs, readmissions have been sort of a key strategy for uh, Medicare leveraging improvement of quality from hospitals and provider groups, as well as saving costs. Um, related, but a little different. So um, the National Quality Forum is this organization that vets quality measures. And um, there's a number of quality measure sets that are used by different entities and in different programs that are important. So we mentioned some of these. The hospital inpatient quality reporting, reporting program has a measure set that all hospitals contribute every year. It changes a little bit from year to year. And those, the performance on those measures are reported in Care Compare that are publicly available and also more recently um, in generating hospital star ratings. On the inpatient quality reporting program, are all the condition-specific readmission rate measures for the conditions that are penalized under the HRP. So acute MI, pneumonia, heart failure, COPD, hip and knee replacement, and cabbage. Those are the current uh, readmission, uh, the current conditions that are penalized uh, for poor performance under the hospital readmissions reduction program. The, Care Compare also reports on a hospital-wide readmission measure that's used in things like the STAR ratings um, or, or in the ACO um, measure set as well. Under the Medicare Shared Savings Program, there's a different measure set called ACO measures, and they report on all-cause readmissions as well as admission rate for individuals with multiple chronic conditions. And they also have another measure called Excess Acute Care Days, which looks at ED visits, observation stays, and inpatient, mission, uh, inpatient readmissions within 30 days of an inpatient discharge. So trying to capture total hospital care. Uh, HEDIS, which is actually far more ubiquitous than the Medicare program. So HEDIS is what is used by commercial plans in both um, contracting with the government and also contracting with hospitals and other provider entities. So 
Um, under HEDIS, they have a plan all cause readmission measure, which now follows both observation stays and inpatient admissions for a 30 day readmission. Um, it's used to rate commercial health plans, but like I mentioned, these, so commercial payers will actually use HEDIS measures also and ask providers to report on them so that they can then use those to determine who should be in and out of network and how their rates can be set. And finally, Medicaid has the adult and home core sets and of those also tracks readmission. And this is what states have to report to CMS. On the flip side, within states, states are using the same kind of HEDIS or these kind of core measure sets also to contract with Medicaid managed care organizations in order to determine you know, which, which uh, MCOs give the best value. So in general, these readmission measures are being used ubiquitously through almost all quality programs now. All right, so um, just to kind of give you an overview of who's participating in these value-based programs. So under the traditional Medicare, without really getting into um, kind of what the different types of alternative payment models are, it's sort of out of the scope of this talk. What I want you to recognize is, so under Medicare, traditional Medicare, only 10% of payments now are purely fee-for-service. Um, half of them are in some sort of pay for performance, either negative or positive incentives, and then um, others are in other types of more advanced alternative payment model structures, such as um, bundled care payment or um, ACO payment. On, on the commercial side, though, you see quite a bit difference where more than half of payments are still in the fee for service um, and with very little like a relative minority tied to value. It's sort of the same for Medicare where two thirds or Medicaid, excuse me, where two thirds of payments are tied to, uh, are still fee for service and very little tied to value. So in general, um, the reason I bring this up is because how sensitive or how much you're gonna be able to squeeze out of hospitals depends on how much revenue is at stake. And so what we can see is that most revenue for hospitals, including most of the, their actual population of patients, are either private, self-pay, or other. Only about a quarter, just under a quarter, of the population are Medicare patients. And so, and then with readmissions, you're only incentivizing a small segment of those. And so, again, uh, because you know we only incentivize six conditions, I just I just say this because. It, it's still a minority of care as long as commercial payers stay outside of the value-based payment models, um, the Medicare policies are only gonna have so much effect. That being said, commercial payers are increasingly developing value-based contracts. It's just hard for me to present that data because it's not published um, and it's kept under wraps. And so, it's really difficult to study the impacts of those, except for a few specific models like Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts uh, alternative quality contract. If you, um. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, what makes a good quality measure? So when we think of quality measurement, we have three types. There's structural measures, process measures, and outcome measures. So structural measures are the resource inputs. Do you have it or not? Um, Incentivizing structural measures can be highly valuable to try to move the healthcare system in a certain direction. So, for example, structural measures were a key component of the High Tech Act in trying to get hospitals to adopt electronic health records and meaningfully use them. Process measures uh, make up the bulk of our current quality performance ratings. Did this patient get a cervical cancer screening? Did you get a repeat lactate uh, after the first lactate if it was elevated? Did you give antibiotics uh, before, excuse me, did you get blood cultures before antibiotics for pneumonia? Did you give an aspirin in heart attack? These are things that are easy to measure and ideally a good process measure will be tied to outcomes indirectly. So we know that giving an aspirin in heart attack should improve mortality and so by incentivizing that, we would expect downstream impacts on mortality and other meaningful patient outcomes. 
But in general, what we really want to get to in quality measurement programs are measuring outcomes. And that is an area that has lagged behind, especially in the, the biggest programs. Um, specifically, right now, the only outcome measures that hospitals are rewarded on under the CMS's big value-based programs are iterations of readmissions and then condition-specific mortality. And what I'm going to tell you is that readmissions are kind of a weird outcome measure. So readmissions aren't a health state like mortality. Readmissions could be good or bad. Uh, in some cases, getting readmitted to the hospital may be the right thing for a patient that will improve their survival. But you would be ranked on lower quality because you had a higher readmission. And this work here also shows that there isn't really any correlation between a hospital's readmission rate and their mortality rate. So they seem to be separate processes. While there's probably a certain group of readmissions that are bad and related to bad quality and would also be associated with higher mortality, in general, there's a pretty weak relationship. So most people would say that readmissions aren't the most valid of a outcome measure to be pegging hospital performance. On. Okay, so that being said, we use them and we use them ubiquitously. So I'm going to kind of jump, um, shift to how the HRP works and then talk a little bit about um, what the evidence behind it is, which I think is important considering, you know, we, we hope that if we're incentivizing readmissions that we're getting some benefit for patients out of it and not just penalizing a lot of hospitals. So the HRP is a really complex por uh, program, but the crux of it is that um, Medicare calculates something called an excess readmission ratio, which is the ratio of um, hospitalization, readmissions that are predicted based on a hospital's given case mix, uh, divided by the number of admissions that are expected had that hospital's patients been treated at the, the mean hospital across the United States. So by creating this ratio, you're standardizing a hospital's performance on their readmission to sort of the mean hospital in the sample. And so CMS calculates this excess number of readmissions or the excess readmission ratio for the six conditions um, that are incentivized under the HRP. And then they put it into a complex payment formula. And essentially what they do is reduce all payments for a given year based on past performance. So in fiscal year 2021, the performance period actually runs from 2007, June 2017 to July 2020. And so there's this three-year block where hospitals readmission performance is evaluated. And if they have excess readmissions in that time, they are penalized in fiscal year 2021 across all hospitalizations. So whatever, how, however bad they are, meaning however um, many more excess readmissions are found, all their payments are reduced to that degree. Um, the top penalty is a 3% reduction in, uh, in billing across every admission. So some data about how this program is working. So in 2021, there are almost 2,500 hosp hospitals that received penalties. Nearly as many hospitals were exempted from the program for various reasons. Either they were specialty hospitals, critical access hospitals, they didn't have enough of a certain condition to be able to assess their performance. The average penalty was 0.64%, which amounted to about 217,000 per hospital. But of course, hospitals vary in size. So we know that the, in, the penalties are much, much higher for many of the large urban hospitals that have higher readmissions as well. That amounts to a combined loss of revenue for hospitals of 521 million, or flip the other way, savings, that's a savings to Medicare because they're not paying it to hospitals. And like I said, the max penalty is 3%, but this is really important. 
82% of hospitals are penalized. So um, even though this is standardizing supposedly to the average performance, the vast majority of hospitals are gonna be penalized under this program and continue to be penalized each year. All right, so given the amount of money uh, that's on the table in this program, we would hope that, like I said, this program is effective. We want it to achieve its aim. We would like to see that it reduces readmissions, but ideally improves care as well for patients. Uh, so there's a lot of evaluations out there that we don't have time to go through. Um, this is probably the quintessential study that evaluated the impacts of the HRP. And I'm just gonna walk through this graph um, so the first thing you should know is that um, because this policy was rolled out across the United States at the same time, we don't really have a great control group uh, to mm -hmm. evaluate the policy effects. And so um, this group tried to look at the conditions targeted, which was um, the first three conditions targeted by the program, heart failure, pneumonia, and heart attack and compare it to the conditions that were not targeted. But it's become increasingly clear that there's been spillover effects um, and benefits to all patient populations um, as hospitals have reorganized processes to reduce readmissions. So it's hard to kind of pull out the actual impact of the program. That being said, I'm just gonna walk through this. So um, the first thing to note is that readmissions were declining prior to the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> Then after the Affordable Care Act was passed, when the HRP was announced, the rate of decline in readmissions increased. And it increased more for the conditions that were targeted by the HRP than those that were not targeted by the HRP. But by the time the penalties two years later were actually implemented, the rate of decline had more or less flattened out and was actually lower than in the pre-ACA period. So the things you can pull from this is number one, there's spillover effects into the non-target population. Good, that's good. And any effect that the policy had probably happened pretty early. And if you remember what I told you, this period around when the Affordable Care Act was passed was also when uh, Hospital Compare began reporting performance on readmission measures. And hospitals knew that coming down the pipeline were these penalties and they would be aware in this early period of if they were a higher low performer and thus could make changes accordingly. So that probably uh, explains a lot of that early effect. But once you sort of implement discharge planning or some of these best practices and then you get a benefit from them, it's questionable like how much more benefit you can get immediately without long-term changes in the health system. All right, and then to summarize some other studies out there. So my read of the literature is that the overall effect of the hospital readmissions reduction program has probably been a, about a one to two percentage point reduction in readmissions. Um, it could be as high as two to 3%. Again, um, that's if we, it, it depends whether or not you, whatever your control group is, if you're looking at the declines in that control group as either spillover effects, meaning that it declined because of the policy too, or if those declines just simply represent secular trends. And so this one to three kind of percentage point range really depends on whether or not you subtract out all of the control group as secular trends or you um, allow for some of that to reflect spillover effects. We note that, like I said, all patients have experienced declines in readmission, all patient populations in the past decade. And we see that after the HRP was announced, those declines, like I showed you, were greater for target versus non-target conditions, for Medicare patients versus commercial payers, for hospitals participating in the HRP versus non-participating hospitals and for penalized hospitals versus non-penalized hospitals. In addition, um, a group out of Harvard, and I'll quote their survey in a, another study, um, surveyed just under a thousand hospital executives and asked what had changed in response to these readmission penalties. 
And they found that hospitals were making meaningful changes. Specifically, they began tracking and measuring readmissions electronically, obviously having to report that as well. But there was heavy invest investing in improvements in discharge processes and care transitions and prioritization of these care transitions. There was um, direct involvement of the CMO and hospital leadership in these processes. So, so truly, we do see, a, consistent with what Medicare was intending, um, sort of an aligning of hospital or, you know, a fulcrum to change hospital behavior around these care transitions. All right. So, so the short story is that HRP probably has, has had some effect. It's probably a modest effect, and I'll show you why. So, um, so that one to 2% doesn't include any decreases uh, for problems in the methodology that have likely overestimated the effects. So there is an entire body of literature uh, that is dedicated uh, to sort of chipping away at the HRP. And in one line of research, there's a number of studies showing that the effects of this program are overstated because of either statistical noise, coding changes, or simply changes in practice and hospitalization practices over time. And then more importantly, there's another line of research that is suggesting that the HRP might be associated with unintended consequences that are actually harmful, specifically for vulnerable patients who are treated at safety net hospitals and potentially may increase mortality for heart failure patients. So we're going to take a look at those. So problem one. So many of you might not be familiar with the term regression to the mean, but essentially whenever you measure an outlier, so you perform an intervention on a patient population that has particularly high costs or particularly bad outcomes, you will statistically find that they improve in the next measurement period. It's the same thing. When you profile providers or hospitals that are poor performing, statistically, they will improve if they're outliers by the next measurement period. And so this study wanted to understand how much of the improvement within hospitals was after the implementation of the HRP could actually be attributed to regression to the mean. And they found that more than three quarters of the change in readmission rates is statistical noise is simply due to this regression to the mean. Another problem, problem two, is that right in this period where we see the greatest decline in readmission rates, CMS also changed its coding practices. So prior to 2011, the form that CMS used um, uh, the form that hospitals submitted to CMS for um, re claims reimbursement only allowed hospitals to put in nine diagnoses. In 2011, that was expanded to 25 diagnoses. So when you have more comorbidities and diagnoses in a statistical risk adjustment model, it's going to adjust down your outcome. So if your outcome is readmissions, but your patient population looks sicker because it has more diagnoses, it's going to adjust that rate down. So you're going to see improvement in readmission simply because of upcoding. And so this study was really important and showed that probably 48% of the estimated effect of this program is accounted for simply by changes in coding. Uh, problem three is the area that I look at with my research, and this has been sort of how um, over this period, many, due to a variety of other policies uh, in the Medicare world, many hospitalizations have been reclassified to observation stays. And so under the HRP, uh, right now, only inpatient readmissions following an inpatient admission are incentivized. And yet, if a patient returns to the hospital and has an observation stay, that's not captured. If a patient was initially hospitalized as an observation stay and then comes back and is either readmitted as an inpatient or a repeat observation stay, that is also not captured. And unfortunately, when we're really thinking about a patient-centered measure of discharge quality uh, and care transitions, all of these would be important, right? So all of 
any return to the hospital or repeat hospitalization may be influenced by quality of care. So it's sort of a huge omission. This study found that upwards of 18% because of those pathways that are not being measured, upwards of 18% of all hospitalizations are essentially invisible to the HRP because of um, CMS's measurement quality uh, policies. And then we saw this in our own work. So I had started working on this topic in the commercially insured population. And so if you look at this blue line here, these are inpatient readmissions following inpatient discharge. And we could see that over this period of 2007 to 2015, those readmissions declined by 18.6%. But when you included observation stays in the mix, the amount of decline was less, it decreased to a 12.9% relative change. And then if you also looked at observation stays, we saw that they had completely different trends. In fact, readmission events were increasing in the commercially insured population. And so essentially when you plug these numbers in, uh, if this was the rate of, re uh, of readmissions per 1000 admissions, adding observation stays to the numerator so counting them as a readmission event decreased it a little bit, but then adding observation stays to both the numerator and denominator, meaning their hospitalizations that you follow forward for outcomes and you consider observation stays as a readmission event, it pretty much washed away any benefit um, or any decline in readmissions that we saw over time. So of course the question is what is happening in the Medicare population? And this is ongoing research right now. Um, that we have, but um, the thing I wanna pull out here is that um, using sort of a difference in difference model, we estimated the impact of the HRP to be about 1.1% comparing target and non-target conditions. And that would be a conservative estimate because it subtracts the non-target conditions completely out of the estimate. But if you add observation stays in, 30-day observation stays, we found that the HRP effect is overstated by about 22%. Um, and then what was interesting though, unlike the commercially insured population, uh, we see evidence of significant beneficial spillover effects of the policy to the population of older adults being discharged with observation stays. So this was a little surprising. Um, readmissions among the cohort of older adults who were discharged with an observation stay had a, has actually declined to a greater degree than readmissions for the older adults who were discharged from an inpatient admission. So actually, if you combine uh, observation stays in the denominator, it ends up, you know, being somewhere in between this 0.86 and 1.1 value. Uh, it's around one percentage point reduction in readmissions as a result of the HRP. However, I will say that in any given individual hospital's performance does shift under these different classifications. And so there's huge implications for any one hospital, whether they're considered a high performer or a low performer based on the population that's included in the readmission measure. All right, and then the problem four related to the overestimation of effects is some have pointed out that aren't we just capturing a decline in overall, re overall admissions anyways, right? Over the past 15, 20 years, there's been a consistent decline in the proportion of patients who are admitted to the hospital. Um, and readmissions have also declined as admissions declined. This is the most recent MedPAC report, and you see that for the conditions that aren't incentivized by the HRP, per capita admissions have actually declined to a greater degree than readmissions. But then when you look at the incentivized conditions, readmissions have actually declined to a greater degree in everything except for pneumonia. So that probably suggests, you know, again, that the HRP is working to some degree as intended. All right, so switching gears. So, um, in terms of probably the more salient problems related to the HRP is this concern about increase in mortality and whether or not it disproportionately penalizes safety net hospitals. 
So who gets readmitted? I think we all know that sick patients, medically frail, medically complex patients are the ones that get readmitted and those with poor social determinants of health. And so it's not surprising that safety net hospitals don't fare very well under these value-based programs. In fact, when it comes to readmission, safety net hospitals have readmission rates that tend to be about two percentage points higher than non-safety net hospitals, but they, and they incur penalties at a higher rate and they're more likely to uh, incur the max penalty in any given year. And in addition, I mentioned how these value-based programs kind of pile on top of each other. So safety net hospitals are also more likely to be penalized under other programs like the hospital-based um, the hospital value-based purchasing program, for example, 63% of safety net hospitals versus 51% of non-safety net hospitals had reductions in payments under the value-based purchasing program. The other thing that we notice is that in general, if you're penalized in one year, you tend to be penalized in out years. So this study essentially um, divided hospitals by whether or not they received penalties in the first year and looked at what happened to them in the next five years and found that most hospitals that were penalized in the first year remained penalized in all five of the other years. Um, and these repeatedly penalized hospitals, we know something about them. They tend to be large teaching safety net hospitals. So um, like everything that isn't black and white, there, there's some nuance around the equity impacts of this because what we have seen is that safety net hospitals have been able to reduce readmission rates and have narrowed the disparity in readmissions compared to non-safety net hospitals. So that's a beneficial impact of the program. There's some evidence that racial disparities in readmissions may have also narrowed in, over time, and that's largely because of the safety net hospitals growing closer in their readmission rates to non-safety net hospitals. Um, you can see too here, this is lines of safety and non-safety net hospitals showing that they, they follow improvement trends similarly. Um, and these safety net hospitals are also more likely to serve racial and ethnic minorities. Um, and so one study noticed that racial disparities narrowed for the conditions targeted by the HRP. But then another study noticed that when you looked within safety net hospitals, that racial disparities actually widened. And so there's a lot of debate right now whether or not this program is good or bad for vulnerable patients. Um, and uh, there's a lot of groups advocating that CMS incorporate socioeconomic measures into its risk adjustment. Initially, those were not incorporated because CMS said, hey, we don't want to hold safety net hospitals or providers that are serving vulnerable patients to a different measuring stick than those serving wealthy patients which makes sense, but the problem, if you don't adjust for socioeconomic status, you also highly disincentivize hospitals for wanting to take care of these patients that probably have worse outcomes. Um, this was part of that national survey I talked to you about where um, they found that safety net hospitals, though the patients faced more barriers in um, care transitions like poor social determinants of health and so forth, they were also more less likely to use important transitional care tools and processes. Um, so they were less likely to verbally communicate with outpatient providers, less likely to use discharge coordinators and post-discharge programs. They were less likely to enroll their patients in post-discharge programs. Um, but I just wanna point out again, the question still hangs. So on the one hand, you could look at that data and you could say, hey, that's an opportunity for really improving care at these safety net hospitals. On the flip side, penalties may simply reduce the amount of resources they have to invest in these evidence-based programs. And we already know that safety net hospitals and hospitals that historically have served uh, racial and ethnic minorities tend to also be underfunded. And so there's a, a real need to kind of monitor the long-term impacts on hospitals that serve vulnerable populations. All right, the last thing I'm going to
touch on before we stop is um, whether or not the HRP increases mortality. So um, this is an opinion piece in the New York Times that essentially uh, what, so it was written by the authors of the study I'm gonna show next. Um, and they asked the question, did the HRP increase deaths? Um, it's pretty sensational. Um, and it was based on this study, which used an individual analysis, and they found that um, for heart failure and pneumonia in panels A and C, that through the implementation of the HRP, that deaths actually increased in those two groups. And in their op-ed, they said, if we assume that the program was directly responsible for these increases in mortality, that prior trends would have, and that prior trends continued unabated, the program may have resulted in 10,000 more deaths among patients with pneumonia and heart failure in the initial years of the program. It's a big problem. This was another study uh, that used a different data set that get with the guidelines data set that also noticed similar trends in the heart failure population. Readmissions decline after implementation of the policy, mortality increases. Um, and since then, there's been some studies that have essentially said the opposite. So I will mention that these two studies that I show up here are from the Yale group that developed the readmission measures and, and really are the architects of much of the HRP and how the program is incentivized. So just keep that in mind, but they essentially find um, no temporal relation. So they, they agree that there has been increasing uh, mortality in pneumonia and heart failure patients, but that this is not temporally related to the implementation of the HRP. And that actually, when you look within hospitals, there's some, there's either no correlation or a weak positive correlation between hospitals that have lower readmission rates and lower mortality rates, suggesting that in general, better quality hospitals that perform better on both readmissions also perform better on mortality. So this is also another area of debate where there's mixed evidence out there on whether or not the HRP is increasing mortality for certain patient populations and maybe an unanticipated effect. And I don't think there's any consensus on this yet. All right, so the last thing I wanna say is, so how many more readmissions can we, can we reduce? So, um, this is from the most recent MedPAC report, and what you can see, these are raw readmission rates, and there's really, since 2013-14, there's been almost no change in the actual readmission rate for the incentivized conditions, despite 80% of hospitals being penalized year over year on this. MedPAC said, hey, but when we look at uh, risk standardized readmission rates, we see those continue to decline. So, Part of what I'll posit here is that when you do the risk standardization, you're capturing comorbidities, including the upcoding and including the fact that because we've siphoned off observation stays and also had advances in care where we can treat more patients at home, the population that's coming into the hospital over time is enriched with sicker patients. And that's going to make the readmission rates look like they're declining when in reality, they're staying the same. So what you can take home from this is that there's probably been no change in readmissions in the past several years of the program. However, hospitals seem to be maintaining stable readmission rates despite a sicker population overall. So that's something to be said. But as we think about the future of these programs, we have to think about how much more can we get out of it? Um, you know, how many more readmissions can the hospital actually impact upon? All right, and I'm, these are also not my ideas, but I'm gonna end with this. So there's um, a lot of lines of thought. So most people don't think that we should do away with the HRP, that it, it's had some positive effects. Maybe in the future, it won't be as effective, but so far the feds like it, it's gonna stay. So I think most researchers in this space are focused on making refinements to the program. And that includes suggestions like including 30-day observation stays and potentially ED visits in the measure, better risk adjustment for socioeconomic status, um, trying to incentivize improvements in readmissions. I didn't really mention this, but for example, a safety net hospital could have made dramatic improvements in its readmission rate, but it still is 
underperforming relative to non-safety net hospitals, and they won't be rewarded for those improvements. So that could be a change uh, where an improvement score is calculated as well. And then there's some uh, calls for developing combined and composite measures such as combining readmissions with mortality so that you don't incentivize readmissions to a greater degree than mortality, or rolling up the HRP into, HRP into like the value-based purchasing program where readmissions becomes a weighted measure in a set of a comprehensive measure set of, um, of quality measures. And so, um, so those are some, some directions we may see the program go in the future. Um, I will ignore the stuff on ACOs. So I'll take questions at this point. Thank you so much for the interesting and excellent presentation. Um, we are right exactly at one o'clock right now. So I wanna give people the opportunity to hop off, but if folks wanna stay behind and ask any questions, um, I'll be watching the chat. Yeah, there's one question here in the chat. Um, can you comment on how accurately we assess comorbidities? Um, yeah, so probably not well. Um, and that's partly evidenced by the fact that the risk adjusted readmission rate is very, very similar to the raw readmission rate. It might only adjust it down by a few percentage points. Um, there's a limited set of comorbidities that are included in any risk model. And obviously there's substantial variability in how hospitals code for those. So, you know, a good example might be sepsis. Some hospitals might call sepsis sepsis. Other hospitals might call it pneumonia. All of those coding uh, is going to impact the risk adjustment model. So certainly there's limitations. 